Okay, that should be fine there, yes. So, um, as I said, I'd like to talk about uh, Landmark, the update on, mm -hmm. the, on the 27th as a preamble to that. We've just come out of the, uh, the combat and classes panel, so I guess that's, that's a good place to start, combat, right. etc. Yeah. Um, first off, uh, the decision to go for a, um, a mouse-based aiming system. Mm -hmm. It was mentioned you don't want it to be too twitchy, you'd rather it be tactical, so could you talk a little bit about a little bit of detail about about, that about why we made that yeah, decision. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of it comes around uh, comes from the fact that uh, we are uh, a lot of games are three D games, but for us the the three D space actually matters more than it does in a lot of other games. So, like um, you you have a upheaval or, or something along those lines that you've seen the wizard use, and you want to blow holes in the ground. Well, you need to be able to quickly target the ground or the ceiling or the wall, right? And you know, uh, the standard MMO sort of uh, trappings that you would see for that would be you'd click the button, it would give you a reticle, then you have to move your mouse to where you want it, want it to be, then you have to click the button in order for it to go off. We wanted combat to be more engaging, more 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 visceral than that. So by, by going with that sort of camera-based movement on, on that and using the reticle in the center of the screen, you can just swing your camera, click the button, and it blows a hole in the wall or the ceiling or the floor or whatever like that. And we, we did, uh, internally, we went through almost a dozen cameras and, and different control schemes to see what felt right. Uh, and what we ended up with, uh, everybody that has played with it um, really did agree on the team that this seemed like the one that felt the best uh, and played the best. Uh, and so we can't wait to get that in the hands of the players and see if they agree with us or not. And if they don't, then we'll, we'll go back to the drawing board and we'll try to figure out what works the best. But this is it's a good compromise. It's not a first-person shooter type camera, but it's also not that tab targeting or lock targeting sort of uh, behavior that we've seen in MMOs before this. Cool. So um, does that mean there'd be no, uh, that no locking targets at all? Is it just you fire and where it goes, it goes? That is our intention right now. Uh, that's what feels the best. Uh, but again, like I said, we, we're open to feedback and iteration on this like we are with everything in the games. Mm -hmm. So uh, I suppose um, I saw one, one thing actually going to the EQ Next panel I noticed was the uh, the archers firing off the roof of the, the Dark Elf Citadel, I thought it looked really cool, but yeah. I, no I noticed there were um, very prominent tracers on the projectiles. Mm -hmm. Is the intention for um, for the projectile to move through the air and be dodgeable and just hit the first thing it hits, or perhaps just pierce in the line as it goes? So for, for EverQuest Next, is, is that because that was a, the Dark Elf Citadel was part I know, of that was that was the, the, the thing that kind of, the thing that prompted me to think about it, but I, I suppose mostly it's about uh, the way that projectiles travel, do they just hit the first thing? So we have the ability to, uh, well, so we have a, a couple of different ways we can use projectiles in the game, and it's going to depend on the ability as to which way it's going to behave. Um, we have the ability to, for instance, pierce. So uh, we have some abilities right now that we've been playing around with that, that go a certain distance, and they'll hit any number of targets that are in that line. So that's, you know, that's that sort of the tactical, you know, I'm going to move around here and now I'm going to fire it because I can hit three people or, or three monsters or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but other ones will stop at the first thing they hit. Um, and if the first thing they hit is the ground, uh, because somebody got out of the way, then that's what happens. Yeah. You know, so that's a, it's, it's, a, it's going to be a mix of those sorts of behaviors. Fantastic. The, the, reason, the reason I kind of thought about it is a bit of a, a leading question into things like uh, players being able to uh, physically block in in terms in terms of tanking and things. We know that movement's very important, positioning's very important. Mm -hmm. So um, a few people have asked me to mention, you know, will they be able to stand in front of another player and take the damage that they should? Well, take? obviously not with a piercing attack, obviously. but with one of the yeah, other yeah. ones that collides and, and whoever it hits first. Yes, you'll absolutely be able to do that. And and the other side of that question is, they can also just move out of the way. Yeah, right. So <laughs> exactly. it, it is something that we want you to be aware of what's going on around you, and it's not. It's not that typical, I've targeted you and therefore my spell is going to hit you unless you get out of range. Yeah. That's not what we're doing. Well, I suppose the, the obvious thing to think about then would be um, how, uh, how you communicate to the players like what, what attacks do what, where things are, are going to land. And another thing I noticed, I keep talking about the EQ next reveal, but I want it's okay. to talk about that. It's okay. The, um, the uh, cleric ability, the big dome one, Heaven's, uh -huh. uh, I forget the Heaven's name. Vengeance? Heaven, okay. Oh wait, no, no. I think, Heaven's <laughs> it's up to you, I think Heaven's Vengeance is the giant hammer, the one where he, where he, oh, where he okay. rose up in the air and then oh, slams was, it down. Yeah, I think that's yeah, Heaven's that's Vengeance. Cool um, I noticed with the, with the, the big dome ability, uh -huh. <laughs> whatever it is, there was um, a distinctive sound there seemed to be and there was a, a ring in the middle that moved outwards <laughs> towards the edge. Um, telegraphs are a very 
yes. are a very hot topic for players. So would can we assume that's the sort of design philosophy as far as Telegraph? Yes, I mean, there's, you know, it's going to go through iterations as we go through it. Of course, everything that we do does. Um, but the idea is, is that we we know that in this kind of combat and this kind of game that we're making, uh, giving that information to the players is extremely important. Otherwise, you just get frustrated because you don't know what's going on, mm -hmm. and therefore you can't react in the way that you should mm -hmm. in order to either mitigate or control the situation or even succeed in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the things like Telegraph and different kinds of particles. You were asking about how we might tell the difference between the different abilities and what they do. Uh, we're going to do that through you know, particle and, and color languages and shape languages so that you'll learn that this kind of thing that you see coming at you, you, you can look at it and have an idea of how it's going to behave. And we try to do that across the board through the game so that it, you, you get that sort of visual recognition. And then if you've seen it once before or something similar to it, you can make assumptions based on what this thing is going to do. And that's the kind of way we're going to handle that. I think personally as a player, I, I, I love systems like that. Systems that allow me as an individual to learn about the game and then apply that knowledge yep. as, as progression. I, I think that's... I think that's really interesting. So would, is, is that another kind of design philosophy? Is it about learning about the world? Yeah, we, we've talked about, Dave talked about it in the, in the keynotes in particular. He said it in probably one of the best ways, which is that in our combat, skill is going to matter. Mm -hmm. And we want that throughout the game. You know, we want you to learn to figure out how to play the way you want to play. Mm -hmm. And then once you've done that, and once you've learned about the world, you can apply that knowledge so you can succeed in areas that somebody who doesn't doesn't apply their knowledge would fail. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we want in both games. <laughs> well, that's, that's good to hear. Yes. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Um, another thing, going, going back for a, a second to uh, communicating um, through the visual language to players, and I assume audio as well. Um, yes. A lot of players would be concerned about that turning into a sort of an effect soup. A particle, effect, a particle effect soup, especially because you know we have to assume you want large groups of players mm -hmm. to be able to fight. Um, is there anything you're doing to combat that, or do you think that you can design around that? Well, we're definitely thinking about that, and and I believe that we will we will come up with solutions. Um, we don't have all the answers yet for that, mm -hmm. um, but yes, it's definitely something on our mind because uh, Darren was just talking about the fact that you know if we were able to because of performance, we would like a PvP battle to have up to 32 people in it. You know. Mm -hmm four teams of up to eight people yeah. you know that's a lot of people and that's a lot of particles going off mm -hmm. uh, and so we're gonna have to make sure that it's not so overwhelming that you can't see what's happening uh, yeah. and it's gonna definitely be a design challenge and, and a visual challenge that that we will have to find solutions for and and uh, the, the team is amazing and I have little doubt that they'll find ways to make it obvious to the players uh, what's going on. Well, I suppose it's uh, one advantage of giving these systems over to players so early that you can, you know, you can work out how to tackle these problems as as the system progresses. Exactly. Um, yeah. Not. I mean, not to rag on another game, but I remember Guild Wars 2 had a lot of this problem where after the game launch they had to kind of tackle that problem and, and dial it back. So. Well, I, you know, I don't know that there's any game before these games. Mm -hmm. There may be a couple of indie games that, that have done this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the games that I've ever made in my career, I've had to do that with. We release the game because yeah. people haven't seen it before, and then we get the feedback of what they what they like and don't like, and then we have to try to adjust with it. Um, and uh, so I did that for years when I was on EverQuest, and, and I joined that game five years uh, four and a half years after it launched and we were still doing that same sort of thing where we were trying to take feedback and, and change the game. Yeah. Um, that's one of the biggest advantages mm -hmm. that we have with this sort of development philosophy. By getting it into your guys' hands so, so early on in the process, we aren't set in stone and we don't have to undo two years of work mm -hmm. to try to change what we're doing. We're building as we move forward and you guys are just all helping us make sure that what we're doing works with everything else we've done and that it's what you guys want and, and I just I love that that, yeah. that reaction and we've seen it for the past seven almost eight months uh, since we went into alpha and and the the feedback has been invaluable across the board so is it is it safe to assume that um, the landmark player base are gonna have as many opportunities to feedback about the combat system as you know the the builders and, and crafters and everything have had. Absolutely, everything we put into the game that that's what we're doing, and and that's why we're releasing these in smaller pieces first. You know, we don't take you know nine months to build everything for the game object system or the PvP system or combat with monsters. We don't we don't make nine hundred different monsters. Uh, before we put them into the game. We want you guys to see them just as, as quickly as we can, and then we'll iterate just like we've done with everything else. 
So, um, if we can back up again uh -huh. a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, there's about 10 things I want to ask about everything. Um, you mentioned the uh, the 32, the, the four team mm -hmm. EVP and everything, large card. I thought that'd be the way the way that the game objects work, as you said, you know, you, so you've, you're starting off with a few a few of these objects mm -hmm. and everything, and obviously the intention is to expand out. Um, yes. To expand out with more of those, is there any way you could give us a, a sneaky hint at what might be coming next? Um, not really. I have to ask. I, I know do you apologize. do. And, and, and <laughs> I always try not to say that we can't tell you about that sort of stuff. But, okay. but uh, I mean, part of the thing is, and, and you know, we, we talk about this a lot, so it sounds like a canned answer, but it really isn't. Mm -hmm. You know, what we want to see is once we get it out there, what's the next thing that everybody wants to see? Mm -hmm. And that will probably be the thing that we do next, mm -hmm. you know, and then we'll just build on that. What's the next big thing that somebody's like, well, if we only had, and I'll pick something random, a timer. Mm -hmm. So that if, if I had a timer, I could make seven different kinds of games. Mm -hmm. And we'll be like, oh, that's a great idea. And that adds so much to it. So we'll, we'd rather work on the timer than whatever the next piece is. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it's going to be feedback from the players that dictates to some degree. I mean, we're working on other pieces that we know that, that, that they're going to want. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, beyond that, it's all about the interactions with the player and what they think the next big thing should be. And then we'll try to make that happen. Of course, I assume so. Pieces that you'll need for EverQuest next as well. Yes. Uh, and then pieces that, depending on what players kind of group around, what what players, uh, how they approach content and landmark. Um, do you do you expect to see uh, communities come up with game types within landmark straight away and? and collect around them. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, they've done it with everything else we've done, mm -hmm. and, and we're going to be releasing these few pieces to start with, mm -hmm. uh, and I fully expect them to do things with it that we never imagined. Mm -hmm. You know, those combined with the, the movement objects that we have and everything like that. Um, and and what will happen is they'll try to create a kind of game mm -hmm. that we didn't think of, and they'll be like, oh, I just need this. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> and that'll be exactly the kind of thing that we're like, you know what? That's awesome. Let's get it in the pipeline as quickly as we can. We'll get it out there, and then they'll find something else with you know they want to make the. I think Darren mentioned it like the you know a Mario style level inside of their claim, and we'll be like, oh, we need, you know, a, a you know not to pick on or not to not to steal anything from Mario, but we need a block that you can bump your head on, <laughs> and we'll be like, oh, I see what that would do for games. Okay, let's try to make that happen, and and it's going to be fun just seeing what everybody does with what we give them and those little pieces that are going to make it so much better. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about seeing how players combine things. That, that's yeah. the big thing for me. So, um, are you ready for a segue? Of course. Talking about how players combine things, uh -huh. the crafting system is, is of a lot of interest. Too. Well done. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm getting used to this. <laughs> uh, so, the the gear and everything, we, we saw the first three weapons. Mm -hmm. They all look cool. They're all obviously a, a distinct style. Um, <laughs> So uh, I'm assuming that those basic weapons are craftable uh, yes. straight away. Yeah, right, o right away. And uh, there, there was a code request in right before I left. There, they're supposed to be. The, you can quote me that it's supposed to be. I can't say it's going to be that way for certain until I get back home. Uh, but they're supposed to be craftable for free. Okay. Uh, so everybody can craft those first three weapons because okay. these are what we're calling the starter weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and they are three very distinct ones so that we can get you playing in the different ways mm -hmm. uh, to give us feedback on it. Yeah. You know, um, they, they may change over time based on the feedback from players to, to incorporate different things, but uh, uh, moving forward, that obviously isn't going to be the case for all the all the items that will be available for people to get in Landmark. So um, in the same way as you get like the starter pick, you'd want players to have a starter exactly. weapon okay, yeah, just because, to get involved. Yeah, if you want to get involved the day one, moment one in the game with PvP, we want to make it as easy as we possibly can. Okay, so thinking about the other end uh -huh. of what that means, uh, and crafting as well, I know that there's a, there's a very vocal community in the MMO space that believe that crafters should be the ones that are, that are providing the, the, the best the, and the, the end thing. game, mm -hmm. if, if you will, uh, was like, do you, is that the kind of philosophy that you're going for? Well, so we have an advantage in the way we're putting the game together in the fact that we don't have the, the stereotypical end game content. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we're talking, a, a couple of people ask questions like this all, over the weekend. Um, it's the idea of uh, providing a breadth of, of exploration of, of how you can expand and get different functionality. Mm -hmm. So uh, a great example might be, there may be a fire sword, but the only way to get it is by finding it uh, from a mob or maybe a chest in the world. Um, and that fire sword has a particular play style associated with it. But there's a craftable ice sword 
that has a different play style associated with it. And there are different places to get different things. So what we're, we're not going to do is create a fire sword you can get in the world that has this play style, and then a craftable one that's slightly better. Okay. You know, so some things will only be able to be uh, achieved by going to a crafter who has collected all the things that are necessary, or found the recipes, or opened up the achievements that allow them to do these sorts of things, and they'll be able to make things that, that are unique uh, for them and that people are going to want, yeah. and other pieces will be out there in the world. So the, the goal is supporting the variety of play styles. That you exactly, have the and of and you know uh, uh, somebody who likes to go out there and adventure and explore, and they find all these weapons, they can take it back to their crafter friends, who can then salvage them to get pieces to make something else that they really want. Uh, Darren actually mentioned it. I, I can't remember which panel it was today because they're a little blurring in my head. <laughs> uh, but he mentioned the fact that the idea is is that. We want every time you get a piece of gear to be important to you, to be something that you're happy about. Even if you've gotten that same piece of gear three other times, you know that there's a use for it that can get you something you want. And so that's, that's one of the big philosophies behind how we're doing crafting and how we're doing itemization. And, and so that'll carry through the entire game. I know a lot of people that will be happy about that. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm one of them. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, so, uh, thinking about that is, would you say that um, salvaging was a big part of your, um, what would you call it, obsolescence strategy? But I know, oh, like in terms you, of, so you, you get like you get the you get to a point of gear, and then players kind of feel like they're done. They're, they're yeah, they're, like they're, so. there's only one piece they're looking for, and they, they have to go yeah, yeah. go try forever to get it. Yeah, I so think obviously some games they do it with obsolescence. Some games have durability and right, so that there. you have reasons to collect the same piece of gear more exactly. than once yeah, and things yeah. like that. It, it definitely is one of the things, um, but it was it was more of a philosophy behind um, looking at. <laughs> okay, looking, looking at uh, looking at other games that we played out there, you know, our games, uh, other people's games, um, that we were trying to remove some of the negative uh, moments in the game. You know, uh, because there's nothing more frustrating than going in and trying to get a piece of gear and you don't get it, and you know, well, I got to go try that next week. You know, to, to try again to get that piece of gear. Or, oh crap, I already had that gear. And so this is, this is a negative experience for me because I got it again, right? Uh, you know, we take that across the entire game. It's not just about getting loot, but um, one of the other things in MMOs that, that it doesn't sound like it's connected, but a lot of MMOs, you don't like it when you see other people which is insanely bizarre for an MMO. Oh. <laughs> a a yeah. game that's about social interaction and playing with large groups of people. Yeah. But I mean, in reality, you know, it means that that other person in a lot of games is either competing with you for, for things to kill, mm -hmm. for things to collect, whatever's going on. And so there's always that little thing in the back of your head that's like, you're not my friend, therefore I don't want to see you when I'm trying to play the game. Yeah. So we're across the board, we're trying to just make sure that all of these all of these just little negative moments that happen in MMOs are they become positives. Mm -hmm. You know, we we don't have the same sort of idea of competing over spawns uh, in EverQuest Next. Mm -hmm. We have this system of sort of you've contributed and therefore you get a reward and how much you contribute is how much kind of reward you get. Yeah. And and it doesn't matter if you and I are both there doing it in the same at the same time and we don't know each other because we're both contributing. Yeah. You know, and, and actually it's better because we're gonna get to move on to something else because mm -hmm. we're gonna get through this portion quicker yeah. and so it's actually a bonus for me to see somebody I don't know that's doing the same thing I'm doing uh, and and gear is the exact same sort of way you get it and it's a positive yeah. you know it may it may not be the same positive of oh this is something new and I really wanted it but it's at least a smaller positive of now I'm working towards a goal sure. like I can salvage that item and that's one third or one tenth Mm. Of, of what I need to make this other thing that I know or, I want. Or if it's more valuable to someone else and they've got something I value, then that's opportunity. Exactly, and, and uh, when we start to talk a, a little bit more about what, uh, what we call the exceptional item uh, system, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's sort of the internal term, I don't know if that's what it'll eventually be called, but it's sort of that idea of that anytime you find something, mm. it may be of use to you, or you can trade it to somebody else who it's of great use to them, mm. and they might have something that's of use to you. Yeah. And there's all different kinds of ways that it can be a, It can be just that positive for you. It's fantastic. Um, I'm gonna be massively self-indulgent now and just be like, it's it's my biggest it's my biggest pet peeve mm -hmm. with MMOs, how I always talk about how everything's compartmentalized. They give you a massive world to play in, and then it's like, we have 
instant instance dungeons with the group final we have instant right instance raids with the group final we have you know battlegrounds to go pvp mm -hmm. arenas to go pvp and it's all about everyone sits in the capital city and teleports it might as well be a lobby right and i think the the biggest thing for for me as a player that i'm excited about landmark and everquest next is the focus is back on the world as as a whole thing a world as being what you're interacting with yeah would you say that's that's a fair assessment of oh absolutely <laughs> i mean yeah. you you can see the fact that i mean we have islands already in the game mm -hmm. right which are we don't think about them that way but they are no different than an instance that somebody could go into to participate in the game mm -hmm. we just make these global so everybody can go into them so we had at launch the ability to create instances for people to go play their game in yeah but if you're going to go play by yourself in an instance and you're not going to play with other people mm -hmm. Then why are you playing an MMO? Yeah, it's and just, so we, we stop doing that. <laughs> we made the decision not to put instances in at the beginning yeah. for that very reason. You know, MMOs are a social game. Mm -hmm. Why do people want to play them as single player games? That's not the game we're making. If if you want to play a single player game, there are tons of single player games out there. And you know what? They do that content better than an MMO can. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, because they they can they can take. Uh, they can take uh, certain liberties in the way they build their content and build their storyline that you can't in even a standard MMO, much less the craziness that we're, try we're trying to, to, to accomplish with all the story breaks AI and, and the changeable world and all those sorts of things. You know, we want everybody focused on the world, not on, oh, I'm going to go into my instance and do what I want to do that day. Okay, one more question real quick. Okay, um, so... It's, it's fantastic to say, uh, like, you, the focus isn't on solo content, but I know a lot of people, like, they, they say it's just so much more convenient to play by themselves, or sometimes they don't feel like it. Do you, do you think that you can make the path of least resistance to be working with other people? Well, it, it's both ways. So it, it's, it's actually a, a mix between um, most of the people that I know in, in an MMO, they talk about solo play and the, the convenience to be able to go in for five or ten minutes, mm -hmm. right? We want to support that. We want you to be able to go in and play the game for ten minutes. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to have to go in. We don't want you to have to go in and get 20 people together to be able to do something, you know, and you have to do a two-hour commitment, mm -hmm. you know. Now, we want those things to exist so that if that's the way you want to play, you can. Mm -hmm. But if you're only going to go in the game for 15 minutes, you can go in and you can play by yourself because remember I was talking about that contribution system? Sure. Right? Yeah. I can hop in and I can help out with something that's going on in an area for 15 minutes and I can do that without having to group up with other people. Now, yeah. there are still benefits for it, but the idea is, is that you and I can do that and we can see one another and if we're in that area, mm. we're going to make a social, hey, like, hey, thanks for helping me out with that. The, the Rose song as well is such an elegant solution to yep. the sandbox problem of that as well. Of, just of how to you find that hint. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. Anyway. Um, so yeah, but it's all about bringing bringing the people together and yeah. giving them the the ability and the desire to work together. Yeah. Whether it's in a group or not isn't the focus in our game. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that you guys are doing the same thing and therefore you're benefiting one another. Yeah. And that's how social bonds are made. It's not about oh, I must form a group of X number of people yeah. to be able to do anything. Mm. We don't want that at all. Yeah. You know, now there will be content mm. that requires that, but yeah. it's not the content that we want you to be doing yeah. moment to moment every day. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I suppose the more you can get people together, the more the trust bonds kind of form, and the more like, people I, can rely on each other. I still have friends from that I made in EverQuest from the the from back in 1999 yeah. uh, that are some of my best friends now, and it was because I met them and we did stuff together, and we have these memories and these experiences that we shared, and and got to know them that way. And that's what an MMO is about: is about, about creating those social bonds between people and. And uh, we're going to do everything we can to try to bring that back mm -hmm. uh, uh, rather than continue down the path of making it more impersonal, uh, which is one of the trends that we've seen recently in a lot of games. Yeah. It's so weird how we agree on everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to let you go before I, okay. before I wear out my welcome. I, uh, thank you so much uh, for, absolutely. for taking the time. It was time. a pleasure. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's really cool. So uh, what are you up to now?